Hi everyone. Um, today I was thinking of doing something a little bit different, which will be a little bit shorter. Um, woo! I hear you all say. Um, many of you might not know that um, when you're running a bookshop, you get to um, think about or we get shown about 7,000 titles a month. Um, and we have to choose between those, what we think will suit our shop, and then if I get a reading copy, um, I will make up my mind quite fast through through um, reading, guess how many pages? Sometimes I can tell from the first line. Sometimes it takes two or three pages uh, for me to work out, yep, this is the goer for me, or mm-hmm, give it a try, whatever. So today I have a book that I haven't actually um, picked up or looked at at all. And I thought, well, how about we do this together? <laughs> um, but I'm going to be doing the reading. You're just going to have to listen. Um, I've decided to have a look at, and I did see a hard copy version of this um, somewhere whooshing around, but I've never picked it up to my great shame because it's an Irish writer and you all know what I think about my Irish writers. It's called uh, Leonard and the Hungry Pole and it's by Ronan Hessian. And uh, looking at some of the blurbs, I think uh, there's a very good reason for me to want to pick this one up. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read um, a couple of pages. Um, if you go to sleep, fine, you won't. It's Melville House. Um, it's, it's one that I'm interested in finding out whether I would read the whole book. So here we go. We'll see what we think. So chapter one, Leonard. Leonard was raised by his mother alone with cheerfully concealed difficulty, his father having died tragically during childbirth. Oh, I like this. Though she was not by nature the soldiering type, she taught him to look at life as a daisy chain of small events, each of which could be made manageable in its own way. She was a person for whom kindness was a very ordinary thing, who believed that the only acceptable excuse for not having a bird feeder in the back garden was that you had one in the front garden. As sometimes happens with boys who prefer games to sports, Leonard had few friends but lots of ideas. His mother understood with intuitive good sense that children like Leonard just need someone to listen to them. They would set off to the shops discussing conger eels and have a deep discussion about Saturn's moons on the way back. They would talk about tidal waves at bath time and say goodnight with a quick chat about the man with the longest fingernails in the Guinness Book of World Records. But Leonard grew up at a time when quiet, imaginative children did not yet enjoy the presumption of innocence. His mother often found herself having to take his side against ornery teachers who complained that they found it impossible to get through to him. With patient maternal endurance, she would sit by herself at parent-teacher meetings explaining that, like his late father, he just lacked a eureka face. Even into his 30s, Leonard's mother still liked to fuss over him, buying him his favourite ham for lunch, the one with fewer veins running through it, leaving tea by the bedside for when he woke up and ironing well-meaning creases into his jeans, which Leonard would quietly iron out later. He repaid her thoughtfulness by keeping her company through her later years and generally including her in the uncrowded bandwidth of his life. I like this already. Leonard was not exactly sure, but there must have come a point when their relationship grew from a purely filial one into one of partnership. Though an adult son living with his widowed mother is a situation about which society has yet to adopt a formal position, it is clearly seen in second best terms. Insofar as anyone noticed, they might have assumed that she was overbearing or that he lacked initiative and possibly a sex drive. In reality, neither sought to limit or interfere with the other, both being independent people who liked their own space and who, quite simply, got along. Leonard did recall some awkwardness around the suggestion that they go on holidays together, though he was not entirely certain which of them had first proposed it. Mother-daughter holidays are normal, of course, and father-son trips are famously storied as a way to come of age. Mother-son holidays, though, have the connotation that one of them must be a burden on the other. But truth be told, they were well suited as travelling companions. She was a keen walker and had good gallery feet. Being able to wander around any reasonable exhibition in its entirety without being distracted by the gift shop honey pot that drew in tired women half her age. They both liked churches, and even though Leonard was not religious himself, much of the world's art is. He would enjoy visiting 
famous paintings and sculptures in European cathedrals, while his mother would busy herself lighting a candle in the side chapel for her fragile, long-departed husband. She never really asked Leonard about girls, knowing the delicacy of the subject for him, and also because of her own doubts about whether his apparently celibate life was due to a lack of interest or opportunity. For Leonard, the fact that he still lived at home with his mother led to a certain self-restraint on practical grounds. He had wondered what would have happened had he brought a girl home only for them to wake up to two cups of tea at the bedside next morning. His mother passed away unexpectedly one midweek night in her sleep, tucked into a duvet with her clothes all laid out for the next day. The neatness, her neatness, being a sign of her respect for the small things in life. The doctor noted the cause of death as a heart attack, but emphasised that there were no signs of suffering or drama. He said that her heart, her heart must have simply run out of beats. I'll just do another bit. As Leonard was a shy child, a shy only child of two shy only children, it was a small funeral. The front of the church was practically empty with the exception of Leonard, as people tended to underestimate their relative closeness to the deceased and sit several rows further back than they should. With no extended family to rely on, Leonard had to multitask at the funeral, reading the prayers of the faithful, bringing up the offertory gifts and taking care of all the other minor jobs that are usually done by cousins and in-laws. The priest's sermon was a generic one about death and hope, which was a relief to Leonard, as his mother disliked it when people summarised a dead person's life in glib caricature. He, had he had the courage, Leonard would have spoken up and said that his mother looked after everyone in her life as though they were her garden birds, that is to say, with unconditional pleasure and generosity. That's not quite three pages, but um, I think that's delicious. Um, maybe you did too. If you think you like the sound of that one, I would say, why don't you pop in and get yourself a copy? Meanwhile, I'm just going to busy myself with reading the rest. Leonard and Hungry Paul, Ronan Hessian. See you next time. I'll probably do another one of those if you like it. Bye.